Dear listeners, in today's episode of The Inkwell, you're going to hear a fascinating conversation with the neuroscientist Nicole Vignola. Nicole has spent years studying the ways we learn and process information. Listening to today's show, you will hear about some common myths and misconceptions regarding our brains, the role that psychedelics play in contemporary scientific research, how to learn skills effectively, and much more. If you're listening on Spotify, don't forget to follow and rate the show. If you're listening via YouTube, press that subscribe button so you don't miss any future episodes when they first air. Okay, now let's pass the mic to Nicole and let's study some neuroscience. Good morning, Nicole. Hello. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, it's lovely that you're here. Uh, I think you're the first neuroscientist on the show, and uh, it's going to be very, very interesting to talk about you, especially regarding language learning. But uh, in general, Nicole, some people don't know what neuroscience is and what neuroscientists do. It sometimes gets confused with psychology and psychiatry and so on. So, So maybe just before we get into the main conversation, Could you please talk about that a little bit? Yes. Um, So neuroscientists or neuroscientists, we study the the sort of the neurobiology, the mechanisms of what's going on in the brain. So psychology will, you know, look at uh, different ways of testing. They don't generally use, well, that's not true. They they will use things like EEGs and um, magnetic resonance imaging, but we are more concerned with the mechanism. So the way that I generally explain it is if your brain is the hardware and then your mental health is your software and psychologists tend to study the software more, not always, of of course, clinical psychologists will go down the route of there's a big interplay with neuroscience uh, and neuroscientists will look at the, the mechanisms of what is going on down to a nanometer scale. So what's happening in the cells, what's happening across brain networks, what brain regions are involved with different parts. And then a psychiatrist for everyone that's asking is uh, somebody who is a medical doctor that's licensed to prescribe medication. So neuroscientists and psychologists are not able to do that and psychiatrists are. Right, well, that's good, that's good. So I guess like uh, it's a very nice uh, metaphor to think about hardware and software and uh, Mm -hmm. psychologists and psychotherapists focus on one aspect while neuroscience does go more on the, I wouldn't say scientific approach, but they're not specifically maybe working with clients or patients they're more work, exactly. working more as a re, as researchers in general yeah exactly so we get clinical researchers and then we get um like la- laboratory researchers and generally speaking so a psychologist will have a clinical uh doctorate but it's in the clinical uh practice whereas a neuroscientist might have a phd i i don't but some neuroscientists have phds and that's more research based that's very cool. That's very cool. So I myself, am, I'm a language teacher and a language learner. And I guess most of the listeners of the podcast are also in one way or another related to languages. Uh, so I will want to speak about the neuroscience of language learning, so to say, Absolutely. a little bit later on. But before yes. that, I have just some questions from my friends. Uh, so yes. I asked them, like, <laughs> what would you ask <laughs> if you could speak with a neuroscientist? <laughs> So one of them wanted to ask whether it's true that human beings only use 10% of their brain. It's not true. (laughs) We use 100% of our brains all of the time, even when we're sleeping. I think that that um, notion came from like motivational speakers. So the majority of our brain operates on a subconscious and it is believed that that takes up about 90 to 95%. So what that means is you don't walk into a room and think about how you switch on the light, how you open the door, how you make a coffee. You just do that as automatic processing. Uh, sometimes with decisions as well, we call them mental heuristics. Your brain will make assumptions on how to make a decision 
based on what has previously been experienced. So again, you don't think about how to turn your car left or whether you should go right at your street. You just know and you make those decisions subconsciously. And then our conscious brain has been thought to take up around 5 to 10% of our brain. That is cognitive control, decision-making, um, executive control. But we do use our entire brain all of the time and studies actually show that we can make decisions on a subconscious level so even when we're thinking about excuse me other things our, our brain can still problem solve and it's the reason why sometimes like leaving a problem to to rest and not think about it can actually be helpful in trying to find an answer because your brain has a database i love the analogy of data as you can tell <laughs> But your brain has a database of all previous experiences that you have been through in your entire life, outcomes, decisions, information from other people, but you can't access that at any given point all of the time. You know, you don't have memories of yourself when you were nine years old, but they might spontaneously arise at any point. And basically the brain can problem solve and make these connections without your conscious attention, which is what's really phenomenal about the brain. So the idiom, I'll sleep on it, actually is a yeah. good thing, right? <laughs> it, it doesn't, exactly. it didn't came out from nowhere. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Or trust your gut. So yeah. Yeah, that's cool. That's very good. And yes. uh, another question was about split personality. So there are a couple of really cool cases. Um, I don't remember the surname of the man, but his name was Billy. I don't remember the surname. But it, he was a phenomenal case of split personality. He had uh, very well distinguished uh, personalities. One had allergies, another hadn't. One wrote with mm. the left hand, another wrote with the right hand. Uh, you know, it, it's it's crazy. Like um, that in one person, there actually can live few distinct people. So I, I think this is, of course, more the realm of psychology and psychiatry. But do neuroscientists study this kind of phenomenon to see what's happening in the brain? How can the personalities cluster? Yes, neuroscientists will study that for sure. Um, I'm not well versed in that. Um, but yes, neuroscientists will be studying it. It's definitely more down the realms of psychotherapy and definitely psychiatry. Uh, but neuroscientists will probably be looking at the neural correlates that underpin why somebody would have something like that or how a area of the brain could have a dual purpose for example like you said the left brain and the right brain and how perhaps one side would be active under one condition but then inactive under a different one which is that for me is the most phenomenal part is that you can't use it in under one context but you can under another i find that really interesting so sorry, I can't answer questions as to why that happens, <laughs> but no worries. I think I think I've heard an interesting case when a guy had an injury of his prefrontal cortex. Uh, I think he was I don't know what happened, but uh, it was severely injured, and uh, he actually his brain actually managed to reorganize itself and function and he managed to live as a person, although he had hang anger issues. And I think like prefrontal cortex has a purpose for not controlling, but maybe managing uh, some more, I wouldn't say primal emotions, but it's like an, it has an executive function to, to manage emotions, so on. Well, as if it's damaged or not well developed, maybe, maybe it cannot really do that. Yes, that's um, Phineas Gage uh, is who you're speaking about. He was um, a, a very interesting case in, in the realms of neuroscience and psychology because he was, uh, I think he was mining mm -hmm. and the, I can't remember what the thing is called. The pickaxe? <laughs> it went through his, yeah, it, it went through his frontal lobe. Mm. And that's where they realized that your personality resides in the frontal lobes of the brain. Which is super interesting. So yes, his brain did reorganize. And that's one of the wonderful things about neuroplasticity is that the brain can reshape and reorganize the way that it needs to. It may lose some functions. In this case, he became very angry. His personality changed completely as well. He wasn't the same sort of person. I put that in inverted commas. But yeah. I, I, guess, I guess when people suffer from stroke or heart attack, mm -hmm. it also damages part of their brains. Like my, my yeah. grandfather has suffered from a stroke and also a father of my friends. And you can notice that if the person recovers, he's a little bit of a different person. Maybe he's not paralyzed, mm -hmm. but you feel like he's not the same 
in terms of who he is even. So yeah. I think that that's the part where the brain reorganizes itself in a new way, well, to deal with the changes, so to say, yes. even yes, if they are absolutely. severe. Yes. And I, I think before we get into the languages, one last question is about the pineal gland, because yeah. many religions focus on the pineal gland, many new age religions focus on pineal gland, and uh, many psychonauts, uh, people who love psychedelics and so on, also speak about it. So it seems like the pineal gland is an important part of the brain, but what mm -hmm. we always listen about is the amygdala, the maybe uh, the, the cortex, uh, and so on, the hippocampus. So I don't know, is it truly that of important part of a brain? Because I think it's responsible with sleep, and I think it's yeah. also responsible with dreams, and I think yeah. it's also responsible with near-death experiences. So, yes. so is it a thing that actually studied? Yes, so the pineal gland, from my understanding, is responsible for melatonin production, regulating the sleep-wake cycle. Interestingly, it's also the area that has stored DMT. Yeah. Uh, so DMT is also a psychedelic drug, and it's one of the reasons why it's associated with near-death experiences, because the brain has a survival mechanism. So when you are dying, your brain actually releases DMT to alleviate the fear of, of the death experience. Um, which can give us a lot of comfort, really. Um, it gives me a lot of comfort anyway, in knowing that you're going to have a truly wonderful experience just before you die, regardless of the circumstance. Um, but that's as far as my understanding goes about the pineal gland, because unfortunately, neuroscience is so complex, I don't have the capacity to study every single, you know, um, area of the brain in detail. My, my specific uh, research was uh, on a more small scale, nanometer scale, where I was looking at how the synapses in the brain communicate with one another. And then I moved on to attention. So how how do we allocate energy throughout our day on different cognitive resources? So how do we spend that energy or cognitive resources on different tasks, which is something I'd love to talk about later in this podcast. Yeah, truly, truly. I think we're done with the rapid uh, questions. And uh, yeah, I think that's very also interesting because anyone who has ever had a psychedelic experience knows that mm. it's sometimes it's not just surreal. Sometimes it feels like it's hyper real. Sometimes it yeah. feels more real than real. <laughs> so, 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 yes. so there's a lot uh, to study about. But of course, uh, a single person, like I cannot study all the languages. I would love yes. to know yes. <laughs> all the languages on the planet, but I have a limited amount of time uh, for choosing the ones that I, I would love yes. to start tomorrow. I know studying Chinese and Arabic and mm. Korean and Japanese yeah. so I can watch anime <laughs> or whatever <Yeah>. reasons. <laughs> no, but I, I, I agree. And isn't it that such a wonderful thing though to know because we have so many things we could learn and could do with our lives. We should never really be bored. You yeah. know, I, I find it remarkable that people feel like they are cognitively not stimulated, uh, bored or uh, lost in life is, is a bit of a broad term. But, you know, for me, it's always reverting back to learning something. You know, I'm learning the katana. I'm taking it up for the first time in my life. I know that you, you're you doing tango and uh, languages, of course, as well. Uh, funnily enough, my book, you know, you mentioned all those languages. My book is going to be translated into all of those languages, which I find That's remarkable. Awesome. It would be amazing if I could read them, but I, I can't. So, you know, there's a lot of, uh, obviously, all this sort of standard. I put that in inverted commas, Spanish, French, Greek, Italian. But then the sort of, for me, uh, you know, I should maybe categorize which languages are cooler but uh, <laughs> Taiwanese um, Arabic uh, Korean Chinese Japanese as well uh, Russian there's a lot of uh, cool languages that is being Hebrew as well so yeah wow that's very interesting and what is your book going to be about exactly so the book is about how to change thoughts habits and behaviors using neuroscience so we all have something that's holding us back Generally, it's rooted in self-belief as well. 
uh, what neuroscience tells us is that these thoughts, habits, and behaviors reside in the brain. And we know that the brain can change. That's why it's called rewire. The book is called rewire. The brain can reorganize and rewire itself to change any of these habits and behaviors at any age. So we are capable of neuroplasticity well into old age. So there is no excuse, um, you know, uh, for having bad habits if you want to change them when you're older as well. Um, it's a three phase program, so it helps you ditch the negative. So it helps you unpack all negativity bias, all the things that hold you back specifically, you know, those kind of like programmings that were given to us by our peers before us. Yeah. It's quite an interesting notion to think that our programming is not necessarily ours, but we can change that. So it helps you really unpack whether you're in the driver's seat of your life and then how to change those negativity biases and thoughts. Then it moves into phase two, which is your seven step neuro toolkit to shift into your new narrative, tell the story that you want to tell about yourself, break those um, habits, bad habits, bad behaviors, bad sort of beliefs that hold you back. And then phase three is how to maintain that positive, how to boost it, because everyone talks about breaking habits and making them, but then the maintaining part is super important as well. So things like growth mindset, resilience, sleep, exercise, how all of these things support mental growth. Cool. So yeah, it's full rewire. Nice. Is it already out? It's out in a month. So I obviously have the pre, the pre, um, the pre-edition, <laughs> but it's out on the 9th of May, so in, in a month's time. Very cool. I remember when I was in my late teens, I think maybe 19, it was the first year of university. Mm. And I came across the idea that our brains mature until 25 and they stop developing. So they stop growing new neurons and well, basically it crystallizes and then it's just decline from 25. And I was sitting there thinking, oh no, I only have six years and then I'm done. <laughs> I thought like, okay. this, is, this is terrible. Thank, thank God that neuroscience proved it wrong <laughs> and there is yes. such a thing as neuroplasticity. <laughs> yes, well, okay, so there's a little bit of truth in that. So when you're born, you're born with a certain amount of neurons, usually, usually around 80 billion. And those neurons stay the same up until age 25. They do start dying thereafter. But what happens is that we can actually create new synapses between the neurons that communicate with one another. And those develop and evolve according to your experiences, your childhood, your culture, your religion, the languages you learn. Um, and then after 25, even though the neuron, so the neuron is the, the cell body, the body of the, mm -hmm. of the, of the neuron, and then the synapses are the branches. Those will start dying off naturally. It's part of the aging process, very slow in the beginning. And then as you get older, even more, then you, of course, you have neurodegeneration, which is a, a rapid change or death in these cells, which shouldn't happen, but of course does. That's how we get neurodegenerative diseases like Parkinson's, um, Alzheimer's, dementia but we can stave them off. So just a little uh, bit of an interesting fact is in the UK, 99 out of 100 cases of Alzheimer's disease are not the inherited APOE4 gene type that we carry in our genes. It's maybe an amalgamation of other genes that then contribute to Alzheimer's disease. But what that tells us is that we have a lot more control over how we age than we previously believed as well. So just to backtrack back to the neuroplasticity, there is some truth in that, that we do start losing neurons um, naturally. Mm -hmm. And I don't want you to be scared of that because we, it, you know, we can stave off a lot of that through our, our, our habits, behaviors, keep keeping learning, exercise, et cetera. But the synapses are what can change. And that's the truly, truly remarkable thing because you can, to some degree, reinvent yourself. Sometimes I get scrutiny online for saying that they're like, I'll never be LeBron James. And I'm like, well, of course you won't be LeBron James, but <laughs> <laughs> you're five foot four, but uh, you know, you can, you can learn new skills. You can become a really good guitarist. You can learn multiple languages. You can change your bad patterns and bad habits, bad behaviors, you know, those automatic things that you've learned as a child. Yeah. Yeah. And it's unfortunate that some people get stuck in their ruts, uh, and just choose not to do that and just, uh, you know, there are cases even from my immediate surroundings that people just become vegetables yes. just because of a lack of activity. Because if you don't use your brain, if you don't move it, uh, yes. you lose it, basically. Yes. And yes. That's it's the like, sad it's part. a muscle. Yeah. It's a muscle. 
But, you know, we have to give people grace because we've been taught this lie that you, you know, like you just said that up until the age of 25, it's, it's, it's doomsday after that. And perhaps those people still believe that maybe they don't know that neuroplasticity is a thing. Yeah. If they knew, would they be more inclined to change? I'd like to think so. I think knowledge is power. But if you don't know that and you think that this is just the way it's going to be forever and never, amen, then I can see how some people would say, well, what's the point? Yeah. But I hope that they can see that, you know, we, we, we can change at any age. It's, it's definitely harder. You know, we lose dopaminergic neurons between five to 10% every decade. Uh, obviously, depending on your lifestyle, you know, you can have it closer to the 5%. And that's a natural part of aging, but and that's one of the reasons why motivation can can veer off as you get older. You know, my six year old mother doesn't want to exercise, and I'm like, well, of course you don't have the motivation to <laughs> exercise. You have done it for thirty years, and now you have less dopamine neurons as well. But by maintaining exercise, like you, if you start, it'll get better. You'll get better. You might even increase dopaminergic activity if you are somebody that's active. Making sure that you maintain that level of activity so that it's just you know, an easier process as you get older is, is much, much easier, but I appreciate that it's hard. Well, also it's, uh, it really depends on the ideology and the framework that a person has in his mind, like determinism, fatalism, or what have you. So yes. just some ideas are very powerful and they get stuck in the mind and it's an excuse or an explanation. And yeah, of course, a lot of things don't depend on us. And uh, a lot of things just happen by themselves, you know, truly. Like we're not, we cannot predict certain things, but there is an amount that we can actually control. At least yeah. I would like to believe. And we should focus on that. But when you think about connectivity, right? Different parts of the brain, different synapses connecting. There, there has been some interesting studies with psychedelics uh, that let's say in a safe environment, you know, no recommendations here, uh, but mushrooms can actually help the brain to reconnect and rewire and different parts of the brain start speaking to each other, so to say. And, uh, <laughs> and, and it's, it's a wonderful thing, but other, let's say chemicals, more experimental ones, uh, can actually damage your brain. And I think it can leave you with I wouldn't say brain traumas, but long lasting ne negative effects. Mm -hmm. So, so, so there's a spectrum and, uh, you know, it's not necessarily bad. It's not necessarily good. Uh, but what, what do you think? Uh, have you ever studied psychedelics in general and what does it do to the brain? To some degree. So one of the interesting things about psilocybin or magic mushrooms is that it they're serotonergic. So they, they're supposed to act on the serotonin receptors. And one of the reasons why, to, you know, this was understanding of mine from two years ago, it may mm -hmm. have changed, you know, recently, um, the, you know, psilocybin research is very vastly evolving. <clears throat> it's just amazing <clears throat> that it is. Thank God, finally, it's back. <laughs> yes. But from my understanding, it's, it's actually creating neuroplasticity in the frontal cortex via NM, they're called NMDA receptors. So our previous belief was that it was serotonin receptors, but for some reason it's acting on NMDA. And that's one of the reasons why I, I believe that psilocybin hasn't been approved yet mm -hmm. because they want to understand the mechanism. They, they, they know it's happening. We know that neuroplasticity is happening. We just don't fully understand the mechanism and we have to get to the bottom of that mechanism before we can, you know, put something out like that into the world uh, legally anyway, or outside of the lab, there's a lot of um, experimental research going on in labs you know and even in the uk ketamine for example is approved as a psychedelic for depression mm -hmm. and ketamine is a really interesting um drug as well in terms of you know uh, depression studies under clinical please don't take Disclaimer. my advice and, go and, <laughs> like <the> <laughs> but <laughs> and not from any shady dealers because it might not be ketamine sorry guys like you can it, be it, somewhere be, where you don't want to be <laughs> It'll be clinical grade ketamine, of course, um, you know, in, in the lab. And Do Dr. Ben Sessa, for example, is one of the leading neuroscientists, uh, psychiatrists, sorry, and psychiatrists and neuroscientists in Bristol, who's got the, the clinic there, uh, which I believe actually may have closed now, but he was lo looking at ketamine studies. 
And what's really interesting, so we have a default mode network in our brain. It's your default mode of thinking. So what are you thinking about when you're not thinking about anything? Now, for people who suffer with clinical depression, uh, generalized anxiety, you know, more kind of psychiatric disorders, rumination, very negative referential self, uh, very negative self-referential information, that resides within that default mode network. So that automatic processing is ruminative most of the time. And what they've seen is that ketamine actually shuts that area of the brain down temporarily to give it a kind of reboot. I put that in inverted commas. That's not the correct term that I would use in a research paper, but <laughs> it, it, in layman's terms, it gives it a kind of reboot so that it can help reconnect to various brain areas more positively. Yeah. Which is super interesting. So I think psychedelics definitely have their place. Um, you know, maybe I'm being a bit cynical and thinking that perhaps they'll never make the mainstream pharmaceutical market hmm. um but that's a conversation in itself and i probably have to take my scientist hat off when i have that conversation <laughs> <laughs> have it more as a friend but um I, I i'm very excited for the future of psychedelics if you know if it if it turns out to 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 evolve that way because i believe that they're trying to patent um psilocybin as well pharmaceutical companies which in the beginning i was very very skeptic very cynical and i thought of course they're doing that but within that it actually means that they can make it cheaper and make it more accessible to people because you know uh it's it's one of the biggest things is accessibility to drugs so yeah i'm excited to see what the future holds and actually i have i have someone who is a psychedelic researcher at imperial college if you wanted to have him on your podcast he is incredible oh, he does loads of public speaking at soho house so I, I can put you in contact with him cool cool uh well it's it's hard to think about the price of let's say psilocybin because if you know where and when to pick, you can go mushroom hunting. <laughs> but okay, <laughs> once again, no recommendations. Let's move I on. I don't. I don't know. <laughs> we can. <laughs> you can tell me about that later. <laughs> and uh, I also heard like really phenomenal feedback from studies uh, with people who had PTSD, maybe uh, victims of rape, or you know war veterans, and uh, how MDMA helped them in a clinical setting to reassess and to get another perspective on the same issue. So they were able yes. to rewire themselves, so to say, via yeah. help. So it's it's nice that scientists nowadays have these tools and they can yes. actually use them in a clinical mm -hmm. setting to help their patients because, you know, it's crazy yes. if you have powerful tools and you're not allowed yes. to use them to help people. But if you can, yes. that is wonderful. Yes. One of the, this is a little bit off track, but kind of, it, it does relate. They did a research study on MDMA recently. It came out two, two years ago, maybe three years ago, where they looked at the MDMA come down and they saw that when they actually administered MDMA in the lab during you know the appropriate hours, people didn't report the effects that one would report with street drug MDMA taking. And what they basically uh, attributed that to is that a lot of it comes from a the fact that it's it's clinical grade uh, mm -hmm. medicine uh, and b it's the associated stress that comes with dancing drinking going to bed late smoking and actually shifting your entire circadian rhythm into a different night uh, into a different time because generally speaking people that are taking recreational drugs would then delay their onset of sleep and go to bed at i don't know whatever time i don't know what what time kids are going to bed these days but <laughs> it just was really interesting to to read that study because it showed that it can have major benefits in the right setting of course please again do not go and buy mdma and administer it to yourself in the daytime thinking that you're um helping but it's just it's a it's a wonderful it's a wonderful time i think for for psychedelic research yeah once again like uh, you never know what you get from the black market like especially with uh, chemical drugs because if you don't have a testing kit which you know every responsible lawbreaker should have uh, if you don't even have that you have no idea what you're dealing with and it can have really severe consequences like believe me i know <laughs> it can have really bad consequences well anyways uh let's go back to languages and the first question about that is it true that the brain of a monolingual speaker, bilingual speaker, and maybe even multilingual speaker, so maybe a person that knows one language, two languages, or more languages, 
are the brains factually different? Yes. So one of the really interesting papers that I was reading this week in preparation for this call was that people who are bilingual or multilingual actually have are better at dealing with conflict because they the brain has to decide which words to use in a specific context and then block out words that it shouldn't use in another context, uh, especially if it's uh, been used regularly. I'm learning Portuguese and I can definitely resonate with that. Uh, it, it also proposed that when you acquire languages later in life, they encode into other parts of the brain, uh, like the supermarginal gyrus, the insula, the areas that are responsible for working memory, which is really interesting because it shows that individuals who are bilingual have better working memory, have better conflict resolution, have better um, cognitive, um, what's the word I'm looking for, like cognitive malleability, so task switching. So you're able to move, shift from one to another. And I don't know if you can resonate with that, but I found that really interesting because they've done functional magnetic resonance imaging on individuals who are bilingual and actually parts of the brain that are responsible for dealing with conflict. And what I mean by conflict is the brain's ability to shut out competing stimuli. Mm -hmm. So you're paying attention to me right now. Uh, I can hear the lawnmower in the background. So my brain is like competing with wanting to shift between the both. And it's about focusing in on yours. So my salience network saying that you, Paul, are important right now, nothing else is. If the sound was less loud, my brain would be blocking it out uh, naturally. Mm -hmm. But individuals who are bilingual, they have better um, control, cognitive control, so better attention spans as well, which I find remarkable. Oh, that's very nice. And well, it requires a lot of an it requires a lot of attention to learn a foreign language, and also yes. a lot of effort on the brain side and dealing with a lot of frustrations. And you know, there's like many things that people who don't learn languages don't think about. But uh, yeah. uh, it's a fun process, but it definitely has its downsides. And um, yes. and what about learn when okay you can learn a language when you're a kid and you can start learning a language when you're an adult generally speaking most people believe that it's better to start learning languages when you're a child yeah but you know like uh again that could start ask acting like an excuse so like i'm 30 or 50 or 60 whatever and i'm yeah. thinking like oh because i have i haven't started learning you know english when i was six i will never reach a good enough level and this this could be a very good excuse for me not to even start doing it because you know that you have the projected idea for the end result like i can do it mm -hmm. that's it but of course that's not true and uh, i'm just curious because once we were talking a few months ago you had mentioned that actually children and adults use different parts of the brain to learn languages, which I found remarkable. Mm -hmm. I haven't heard anything about that before. So could you please expand a little bit on that and just the basic mm -hmm. differences of language learning regarding the age of a person? So when we are children, your brain has basically got real estate, cortical real estate available for rent. Whatever you encode in is what is going to take over. So if you expose a child to multiple languages at a young age, that will be encoded. When you reach adulthood, all the cortical real estate has been taken up because the brain needs to maximize. It's not going to keep space, space open, if you will. So what happens is that secondary languages or anything we learn on top means that the brain has to reorganize itself. And what generally tends to happen is that secondary languages are encoded, as I said, in areas that seep into uh, working memory. So basically, language is encoded in mostly the left side of the brain. So we've got Broca's area and Wernicke's area. Broca's area is responsible for generating words and then Wernicke's area is responsible for attaching context to the words. Uh, and comprehension. The right side of the brain also is responsible for language. So I want to steer away from this idea that we're left brain or right brain because we use both sides of the brain of equally. Now, <clears throat> excuse me, 
the right brain is more responsible for the nuances of language. So like sarcasm, irony, metaphors. So you need both sides to be working effectively together at the same time to comprehend language. Whether somebody doesn't understand sarcasm and there's an impairment in the right hemisphere, that could be that could be true. Uh, some people are better and, and other people are not. But with secondary languages, when we learn them as older adults, we take up more different space to those areas, which, you know, these areas are residing in the temporal lobes, which is the side of your brain. And in the side of the brain is also your working memory, um, uh, emotional control. So they start going into that. And that's why it's believed that work, people that are bilingual have improved working memory and cognitive control. Cool. because it takes up some of the original area where the native languages are encoded but also more because there isn't <clears throat> necessarily enough space if you will mm -hmm. in the original spot where language should have been right right well so that it means it was a good idea to invite my dad to madeira and uh, yes. convince him with the idea that it's good for my little sister because she's six and yes and they have visited uh, the canary islands a few times and she has heard a little bit of Spanish. Now she has heard a little bit of Portuguese. And this is like my, <laughs> you know, like big brother teacher language learner plan to mm -hmm. kind of throw seeds. And who yes. knows, maybe it's gonna grow in the future. So I think it's good to expose children to different environments, cultural environments, yes. linguistic environments. Yes, you know, improved working memory is, uh, I think it's a, it's a wonderful, you know, you might as well, you might as well learn another language. And I just wanted to backtrack a little bit where you said about the belief of, about not being able to learn when you're older. Mm -hmm. There's a woman called Aaliyah Crum, Dr. Aaliyah Crum from Stanford. She studies mindsets. Mm -hmm. And what she's seen is that your mindset and belief around whatever it is that you believe can actually have an impact on your physiology. So what they did is they took uh, uh, cleaners in a hotel and they asked them, how much physical activity do you do on a weekly basis? And they all replied with close to none. They didn't believe that their work was physically active or <laughs> beneficial to them. Right. Okay? And then they gave them an education. And so they, they measured their blood, uh, their blood pressure, their heart rate variability, their resting heart rate, and then you know, took more sort of cognitive um, scales of how they felt and you know, whether they were happy, satisfied. And then they gave them a 30 minute lecture and education on um, the benefits of what their job is doing on their physical well-being. They then tracked them over the course of a month, over four weeks, and they saw that these women lost weight without having changed anything. Their blood pressure came down, their heart rate variability increased, which is your ability to shift your central nervous system and their heart rates as well their resting heart rates so the blood pressure for me was the most valuable one because their belief around around the fact that their job isn't no longer stressful but actually beneficial to them meant that they they, they adapted their physiology in response to that and that is phenomenal they then did further research to, to prove this which i won't get into now because i could talk for hours but you know, your mindset around what you can and can't do is a huge driver to whether you're going to learn something or not. And it's one of the reasons why I believe that I've gotten relatively good at Qatar in such a short space of time, because I know the understanding of what's happening to my brain. I'm, I'm committed. I understand the frustration. I'm in that frustration part now. Where I'm like, oh, it's just easier if I don't do it, you know, much like language. Um, but knowing and that you can do it, and not only that, believing that you can do it well, can definitely shift and that's why we're saying we need to have grace with people who become sort of vegetative because if they knew different would they do different and i hope that people listening to this will go oh my gosh okay actually the the sky's the limit right we're going to the stratosphere put on your helmets <laughs> got some license because we're going up <laughs> but just like when you meet a beginner gym enthusiast and when he thinks that all he has to do is go to the gym seven times a day, beat himself to death, and he will have remarkable yes. results. Uh, most yes. experienced gym guys know that that's not the case because yes, recovery is very important. Exactly, you have yeah. to recover, you have to rest. And I guess while learning new skills, new languages, uh, guitar, anything that is new to you, uh, you have to spend some time letting it all sink in right so so yes. to consolidate the memories 
uh, the new the, to consolidate the new information. So, yes. so what do you think? Like when you think about, let's say, your guitar practice right now, right? So, then not just the intensity but the frequency of guitar playing. How frequent do you practice, or is it more like just I feel it and I do it? Uh, and then how much time do you let your brain to actually like sleep on it and yes. encode all the new information? So then the next time you pick up a guitar, you, because I'm also a guitar player and I know that like uh, you're really hammering it down the evening before and you feel like, oh my God, I cannot do the solo. I cannot do that. Yes. I cannot do something that you're really working hard. You take a little rest, maybe you even sleep, and the next morning it suddenly just becomes easier. It's like, whoa, mm -hmm. okay, I can actually do it a little bit better than the night before, but mm -hmm. I haven't been practicing. So it's just mm -hmm. consolidation of information, I guess. So what, what's about yes. that? Well, I love that you said that about sleep because all our memory consolidation happens when we sleep. And what is memory consolidation? So memory consolidation is you acquire information through the day, but that information is fragmented in the brain. It's gone to the short-term memory centers, perhaps even the hippocampus where it, you know, it goes, but it, it's fragile. It could easily be lost. When we sleep, that memory consolidation makes the, this is obviously like, you know, gen, very layman term language. It becomes solidified in memory centers. So it actually gets ingrained in um, in the brain, over time that short sorry, in over time that memory then actually migrates to longer term memory centers which reside in the neocortex, so the the cerebral cortex, which is the kind of the last layer of the brain that has got the um, long term memory amongst loads of other things. Mm -hmm. But so you can see how something that is from acquiring to being good at it needs time and process to migrate from a fragmented memory into a more solid memory and then eventually into a long-term memory that is semantic semantic meaning that it happens without thought mm -hmm. you know you don't think about how riding a bicycle you just know that's semantic memory and language can then do that as well so you know it's all part of the process and one of the things that i wanted to explain is that with any language, sorry, any learning, there are two things that need to be active in the human brain. So one is the acetylcholine, which is a neurotransmitter, and norepinephrine. So norepinephrine is responsible for being active, kind of priming the neurons to say, like, we're ready to absorb information. You, we probably have high levels of norepinephrine right now. And an acetylcholine creates a cone-like of attention on what it is that you want to learn. So children can absorb information from their environment. You, as adults, we have to tell the brain what is important. So you can't put on a French language tape background, uh, sorry, French language tape in the background and just ex expect to learn it. You have to pay attention to the words. That's where that acetylcholine comes in, where you're driving that information to the auditory cortex that then says, we want to know what this is saying and, and paying attention, right? Uh, trying to comprehend it. So the more that you're, uh, increasing these neurochemicals, the better. You can have it more in terms of like uh, volume. So you a really intense session where you're really paying attention. Maybe you have a teacher like you that's actually guiding you through everything. Or you could have a more lower but more frequent um, sessions where you do five to 10 minutes every day. Mm -hmm. Now the brain works on repetition. So the more you repeat something, the better you'll get at it. So whether you're repeating an hour every day, maybe that's too much. An hour every day is a lot for the brain to be able to withstand that level of, um, you know, information overload uh, or acquiring. So you have to find what works for you. For me, it really is doing two one hour sessions a week with my teacher and then every day, even five to 10 minutes. You know, what I've done is I've personally put a... Um, I've, I've got like a list of things that I can do on the days where I don't feel like practicing and I'm frustrated. So it will be something simple like learn to shift from the G chord to the C chord, which for me is the hardest yeah. shift because the, the thing it's is like I have to do quite a big movement. It's like, it's like going. Yes. Yeah. It's a exactly. big one. So on the days where I don't feel like practicing or I'm like, oh, what should I practice? I'm not in the mood. I just do that. So having that backup plan of saying, okay, well, if I don't feel like it, maybe just practicing one sentence of language learning 
in 10 minutes or something, you know, sure. because through repetition, we can also then stay accountable and we learn on positive reinforcement. We don't learn on negative reinforcement. If we did, then every time you beat yourself up about having a cookie or a cigarette means that you would change your habit straight away. <laughs> but we know that doesn't happen because people still smoke and people still eat uh, cookies when they shouldn't. Again, nothing wrong with eating cookies, please. I'm not trying to demonize cookies. But <laughs> you, get the general, you get the general gist of what I'm trying to say, right? <laughs> eat the cookies if you want to i'm a big <laughs> proponent believer of eating what you know uh, whatever what you, you want to. yeah whatever you know what helps I mean. <laughs> yeah no the cookie's fine but okay so back back to, to to learning what was my point i was trying to make um yes so we learn on positive reinforcement meaning that even doing five minutes and going oh my gosh i did that i didn't feel like it but i did it dopamine spikes dopamine is responsible for learning what made you feel good and the brain wants to do that again and again and again. This is why we get addicted to social media because it, it increases dopamine hugely. So if you can do five minutes of language learning and then go, oh, wow, I'm so proud of myself for doing that, even though I didn't want to, mm -hmm. you then learn that's going to make you feel good. And the next time it's going to feel easier and easier. Well, this is also an important part because like currently I'm learning two languages at once. So I, I, I have started learning Russian four or five years ago, mm -hmm. uh, pre-war situation. And, and I continued learning it, uh, due to the fact that, you know, there are just many people, not just in Russia, but outside of Russia that speak in Russian, like my neighbors from Kazakhstan, uh, the guy speaks in English. So we communicate in mm -hmm. English, but his wife speaks only in Russian. So right. I can either not speak to her completely or try out my broken third language to communicate. Yes. Uh, yes. But it's a very difficult language. It requires a lot of attention mm -hmm. and effort, and there are so many details. And you really yes. have to spend a lot of time and a lot of attention. And like you have to do a lot of repetition regarding grammar to actually get it right. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, there's Portuguese. So Portuguese for me is an easier language because it's quite close mm -hmm. to English in some Gods. It doesn't have that many grammar peculiarities. It has some irregular verbs, and you know, and you have to learn the conjugations, and that's not easy. But if you're an English speaker, you can understand the logic, and you have associations. So also vocabulary is quite similar. So in my mind, whenever I'm learning, to when I'm learning two languages, there I feel like they're competing for my attention. Mm. Mm -hmm. And it's very hard because when I study one language, I feel like the other language is suffering. And when, mm -hmm. when I switch to another language, I feel that that language before us. So, so it's like, you know, like having two girlfriends <laughs> at the same time. I never had two girlfriends at the same time, Paul, I must say, so I don't Sorry. know what it feels like. <laughs> <laughs> just, just a metaphor. <laughs> <laughs> It's like, it. <laughs> it's like having two relationships and m most of the time, like if you're a sensible person, you know, this is not going to work, <laughs> right? <laughs> this is just not how things go. <laughs> so, yeah, so you it. ought to stick to one, but I'm trying to manage two. <laughs> You double data, <laughs> you double dating. Well, look, I think that, you know, learning, so I, I actually have two guitar teachers and they both have different styles, which in the beginning I thought, well, this is a mistake, but actually I find that the, like they, you have a neural network that's like meshed, right? So you're going to take points of information from another one and deduce a solution. If that makes sense. So learning two languages of one could potentially be benefiting each other because you might learn something in one language that then applies to the other one, even if you didn't really realize that. Mm -hmm. So could could or couldn't, you know, there's pros and cons uh, to dating two women at the same time. So <laughs> <laughs> you could learn from one or the other, but you could also, you know, take up your attention so much that you neglect both. <laughs> so so that's, that's the problem. And it's like, of course, it would be great if that's all that I did. So, you know, yeah. that's all of my responsibilities, but I also work. Yes. So I teach languages, I teach yes. two more languages. So sometimes I, in a day I use four languages and then I feel mm -hmm. like I'm in the stratosphere, yeah. like what is happening? And then there's gym, there's tango, there's jujitsu. And sometimes I feel like it's just too much of 
a load on my brain to take in the new information and to consolidate it because mm -hmm. maybe there's there has been four or five new things that I've done during the day that require my immediate attention and you know not just like a certain level of attention just like oh, yeah just put an eye on it it's like full focus and uh, I just feel like the brain cannot really maybe that's my um fixed mindset so to say mm -hmm. but uh, is so there a limit is. like to how much you can take in we have a limit to how much cognitive processing we can do in the day and it's the reason why we have things like vigilance decrement so by the end of the day your attention's going it's like as an example with dog training for example if i train the dogs within 10 minutes you can see they start making mistakes they they stop dropping the ball they that's a metaphor as well but uh, and it's the same with humans like we only have a certain amount of energy but this is where my research comes in so you can actually replenish energy resources by taking uh, strategic brain recoveries so taking a strategic break a mental break what that means is it could be what well, my research was looking at mindfulness meditation so actually closing your eyes I know that there's research from Dr. Andrew Huberman that looks at non-sleep deep rest, which is, again, a type of meditation or rest where you're closing your eyes, you're going deep into this state of uh, rest, but you're not quite sleeping yet. There's memory consolidation happening in those, in those times. My research didn't look at memory consolidation, so I can't say for certain whether mine showed that, but I know that there is other mm -hmm. research that shows that there is memory consolidation happening there. So, you know, maybe taking regular mental breaks during the day. When I was writing my thesis for my master's, I would like write for like two, three hours, like going, I mean, I'm one of those people that leaves things to last minute. So I knew that I could get it done in 10 days. So I started 11 days before the deadline. <laughs> I'm not recommending Crazy. anyone to do that, but I know, I know my limits. So, and what I was doing was I was taking these strategic breaks every few hours, uh, to 10 to 20 minutes where I was sort of closing my eyes because the natural inclination is to want to grab your phone and go on social media and scroll thinking you're giving yourself a mental break and mm -hmm. that that was my research is that people have this perceived idea that social media is a break but it only it gives you that perception because it's task switching onto something yeah. else but on a cognitive resource um level it is taking more more energy more attention mm -hmm. more glutamate which is the the, the neurotransmitters responsible for attention so you know, making sure that you're being strategic with how you spend the time in between and maybe incorporating some meditations in the day could be really valuable, especially on the days where you're more busy because it will help consolidate that memory in the time and in, in turn also replenish those resources. So I definitely encourage you to give it a go and let me know anecdotally how you feel. It'll be nice, it'll be nice to, to know. Well, we're kind of coming to the end. I know you will have another call soon. Uh, but just a little note on the last thing that you have said. Actually, when I was like maybe also 19, 20, that was the first time when I tried out meditation and I have been doing it on and off ever since. And uh -huh. um, I used to be very diligent a few years ago, but that whenever I, when I have moved to Madeira, it changed a little bit because the lifestyle changed and, you know, circumstances. But I still do it uh, a few times a week. And okay. it's quite interesting because when you sit in the morning, let's say, and you're, you haven't yet focused your attention anywhere, it's the first time that you're actually really working on focusing your attention on the breath, on the sensations in your body, you know, on anything. Sometimes people think that you shouldn't have any thoughts and that's, I think, incorrect. There will be thoughts, like you can just say you're hard to stop beating, you know? <laughs> Like it's yeah, good that no, it beats. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you you can't not think of anything. I think we got diluted somewhere in the in trying to uh, in help people embark on this journey of meditation. Exactly. So, you know, I can understand the notion of clearing your mind, but you're never going to not think about anything. No. So, and that's not the yeah. goal. But it's like just how much you attach yourself to your thinking, and if yeah, you're exactly. and if you're able to observe it from like this uh, non-attached perspective. Uh, it's also just like switching your attention like from the breath to sensations to what's happening in your mind it's just checking it all out you know you're like wow what, what's what's here you know what's there and you see that your mind is making such interesting connections that you wouldn't have made if you were trying to do it actively so you're yes. letting it go on its own so to say and then and that's yeah. that this is, gets interesting who is letting who to go on his own <laughs> whatever 
a topic for another well, time. <laughs> yeah, definitely, because my belief is that we should nurture both. And we don't nurture the inwards enough because we're always living outward, gaining information, having conversations, scrolling, thinking, planning, getting ready for school, getting ready kids for school. I don't have kids, but you know what I mean? And we don't go in enough. So I love that you said that because I think we need to nurture both parts of our brains, if you will. And I think like if we would, if we will do a second round next time, uh, I would yes. love to speak more about meditation and as you said about psychedelics and, you know, some specific topics that we could select, but I think these two would definitely make the cut. And uh, yes. yeah, well, Nicole, to respect your time, uh, I think for today, that's it. And uh, really thank you. Uh, a big thanks for all the information that you shared. And you know what? I think it's going to help people. Thank you so much for having me. I also like to keep these kind of podcasts around an hour because I find that the information is so heavy loaded. You're hearing new words like temporal gyrus, esoteric singular <laughs> cortex. People are like, what the hell? And I find that, um, you know, well, it's been proposed that we have a maximum of 90 minutes. Uh, we can concentrate for a maximum of 90 minutes in one sitting. Then we have to take a break and then again. So that's one of the reasons why I like to keep it around an hour because most people don't have the attention span for 90 minutes. I personally don't. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, then you have to watch it in parts. In bits, yes. We'll have to have a follow-up. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I would love to because meditation yeah. is a huge topic that also is connected with learning because I'm yeah. a firm believer that it helps you to consolidate information and introspect as well. So it's, it's a great thing to learn about yourself and learn outwardly as well. And yeah, let's keep it for round two. Thanks, Nicole. Thanks for joining today. Thanks, Paul. It's so nice to see you and yeah, chat. <laughs> yeah. Best of luck. See ya. <laughs>